All right. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. My name's Ken Klein. I'm with Quest Software. What we're going to be talking about today is the importance of management in a desktop virtualization environment. And what we're going to start out with, actually, is going to be just kind of a discussion overall of the importance of management in just a virtual infrastructure environment. And we'll tie that into desktop virtualization as we go along. And just to kind of add a little bit of levity to this, I decided to tie it to the t a kitchen metaphor. So, you know, when you think about the kitchen, you gotta have somebody who's in charge, otherwise things really get messed up. You got the head chef and you got the sous chefs to keep things going. And if you don't have someone in control, then things get, you know, kind of messy. Data centers is kind of the same way. You really need to have someone who's in charge to dictate how things go. Um, and when you think about it, the data center is, you know, kitchens are kind of dangerous places with knives flying all over the place and, you know, a lot of spills and things, but a data center is a much more complicated environment. So management in the data center becomes even more critical. What we've done at Quest is we've developed what we call our virtualization management maturity model. And we've got five phases to it, going from limited through strategic. And these phases will help you achieve your management objectives. Um, when you look at it, the first 40%, getting, you know, getting to the point where you're, you know, here at finish with limited and up into the basic level, that's fairly easy to achieve. Um, the limited model is essentially just saying that you've started. You've got your virtual infrastructure stood up, you're creating virtual machines, and things are rolling. Um, and the, the kitchen metaphor, we've got some stock in the pot, so we're beginning to make our soup. To get to the basic maturity model, you really need to have a bit more of an understanding of what the benefit, you, know, you, you understand the benefits of the, the virtualization path journey, but you really need to have a little bit more understanding of your personalized environment. So it's not really too hard to get to this level. Uh, you still, you're reactive to problems, you know, you don't have very proactive management of problems and things such as that, but um, you're, you're making progress. What's holding up the progress? What, you know, what's the difficulty in getting from this 40% limited maturity level model up to the next level? Really what it amounts to is it's cultural to the greatest degree. Um, it's like most things when you start looking at technology. A lot of times technology is not the challenge. It's the, the personalities that are involved. And this is very much the case here. When you look at getting to the next level in the virtualization management maturity model, you've got to have people adapt the way they think. You've got to start looking at doing things in a more automated fashion. People are very set and comfortable in their ways. It's like, you know, I don't know where you guys are in your virtualization journey, but I know that with most customers that I've dealt with, their first step into the virtualization world, they P to V a couple of servers, and they keep doing things the same way they've always done it. They don't adapt their processes and procedures to the virtual environment. They still do the same things. You know, they patch it the same way they did in the physical world. They run antivirus the same way they did in the physical world. They do everything the same way they did in the physical world. So they're really not taking advantage, excuse me, of the capabilities that are there in the virtual environment. So that's really the biggest stumbling block is, is that hesitation um, and when we look at it, what we're really looking at getting to is this proactive problem management. And able to get to be able to have proactive problem management, that means that you've got to have visibility into your environment. You have to know what's going on. You have to be able to react quickly when a problem occurs. So that means that you have to be able to identify that the problem has occurred. And you don't really want to have your users calling you up saying, hey, my system is non-responsive, be the first indication that there's a problem. Um, you also need to establish performance baselines to enable you to, uh, to know when things are going on. Because, you know, you may see if you've got your server farm is typically running at, you know, 30% utilization and you see a spike up to 50%, that could be a sign of something bad. Uh, but then also a, a, a lull, seeing the performance drop down to 20% could also be an indication of something that's not going right. But if you don't have your performance baselines, then you're not going to know that. And these baselines are going to have to be over periods of time because in a lot of organizations, you have cyclical things that happen. So, you know, 30% is your typical normal baseline, but end of quarter, you may spike up to 50% and that could be a normal thing. 
but without having those baselines in place, you really don't know whether it's uh, normal or abnormal. Okay. Once you've achieved that um, that 60% or the 40%, you know, once you've achieved the 60%, then going to 80% is still, this is another challenge. Um, and this is once again because of the, the needs to adapt people to the process. You need to, you need to begin implementing new procedures. Um, and it does require automation. The, there's no way to reach 80% on the maturity model without automation. And in order to have automation, that means you have to have standardization. And this is one of the things that really challenges people. Um, one of the best ways to achieve standardization is to start having a catalog of service offerings so that you can, your users can come in and they can select from a catalog, you know, this is what I want. I want a, a system that provides these capabilities. It could be an IIS server and a database server uh, that, or a web server and a database server that can support X number of transactions per minute and has this backup characteristic and, you know, these types of things. But by doing that, you're standardizing your environment and you're, in, you're enabling automation. So those are key requirements. The other thing that it does is that it empowers your users. Now, because the user should come in and select from a predefined list of items, they can come in, they can make this selection, they can say that I want this service to be available starting July 1st, I want it to run through September 30th, um, you know, I want these performance characteristics, I want these data protection characteristics, and you know, just sign up on a web page and it's done. So you're empowering the users, and during that empowering of the users, you're taking a burden off of your IT staff. So no longer are they required to go out and manually provision these systems and to ensure that the infrastructure is in place to, uh, to support them. That's all being handled via your automation process. And what this does is it frees up your IT staff. Um, once you've hit that level, you've got the automation process, the procedures in place. Getting up to the 100%, the, the, the level four in the level virtualization management maturity level model is actually fairly easy. Uh, you know, it's getting, you've got, you've already done the hard part as it says here. You've achieved the cultural shift. You've got your users or your administrators, not even necessarily your users, but your administrators are now adept at using the automation capabilities that are there. They standardize their processes and procedures, and everything is easy to you know easy to work with. Um, you've got capacity planning. You've got an in optimized infrastructure. All of these things are in place to enable you to hit that um, optimized level. The things that you want to look at here. Um, one of the hardest things at this level, with the, the level five and the maturity model, is having the ability and the flexibility to adapt to new technologies. And that's difficult to do if you've got vendor lock-in. Um, because if you've, got, you know, if you've got a single vendor solution and you don't have the hooks to enable a, a, a new technologies from other vendors, then it's very hard to adopt new technologies that provide additional capabilities very quickly. You may have to go through you know, extensive, a lot of times there's political things that you have to deal with. Um, but it, you, know, you wind up having extensive difficulty in incorporating new and exciting new technologies. So that's one of the, the, the biggest things that I've seen people have a tough time with is to avoid that single vendor lock-in as you're moving through the management maturity model. So question is, where are you at in the, level, the model and where do you want to be? Okay, what does all this have to do with desktop virtualization? Well, desktop virtualization touches more parts of an IT infrastructure than anything else. I mean, server virtualization touches pretty much everything in your data center. When you look at server virtualization, you've got you know, your server hardware that you're touching, obviously. You've got networking, you've got storage, uh, you've got policy or processes and procedures, and everything that's in the data center, backup policies and everything, Everything in the data center is touched with server virtualization. When you look at desktop virtualization, you're using all of that stuff that you're using for server virtualization, plus you're extending outside the data center. Now you're looking at the, um, where is it at? Um, you're looking at touching you know, outside the data center to end users and connectivity options. And 
you need to have pervasive monitoring and management capabilities to be able to have visibility into this so that you can track it and manage it. And the SLAs that we defined back in the aligned level of the maturity model are critical. One of the things that you're going to find is that uh, end users are not very tolerant of variability in the performance characteristics of their, of their desktop. And you also have a variety of endpoint access devices. In the data center, you've usually got a lot of standardization. But when you get out onto the end user, end user devices, you have a lot of variability. I, one of the things that we're seeing at Quest, particularly when we look in the educational market, but it's becoming more and more common in the enterprise market as well, is there's a large prevalence of Macintosh computers that are showing up, in, particularly in the education market. The average um, university that we're dealing with now has approximately 40% of their students are using Macintosh, you know, a Mac of some v variety. And what we're seeing is that 60% of the new students who are enrolling are coming in with Macs. So they're currently at 40% and each year they're having a new 60% come in. So the percentage is growing significantly. <clears throat> And then you've got uh, Linux and thin clients, which are you know, showing up all over the place. And then the, the other thing that's really becoming challenging is the mobile devices, things like iPads and Android pads, you know, the, 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 the mobile devices to allow you to roam with your connectivity and take your applications with you. Those things are becoming much more uh, prevalent and those are very challenging because the connectivity to those things is not consistent. As you're roaming, you know, you may have 3G connectivity one day, you may have 4G the next, and if you're lucky, the next day you have edge connectivity. Um, so it becomes very challenging to manage those devices. You also have um, printing, which is a challenge in every environment. And um, remote peripherals, one of the things I didn't put on the slide was peripheral support. Um, when you look at your desktop, you have a lot of things like USB. People want their USB thumb drive that they can plug in. They want to be able to plug in their scanner, their webcam, their printer, you know, all these things that in the data center, you don't have that variability. When you're looking at desktop virtualization, you certainly do. And this last bullet, the eighth level of the OSI model, and you're all pretty, probably pretty well familiar with the seven layer model, but the eighth layer, which I call the politics layer, becomes even more important in desktop virtualization than in any other aspect of, um, of IT. Because as I said, you're touching something that people hold very near and dear. It's a very personal device is that the end user computing platform. So how do you manage all this stuff? When we start looking at desktop virtualization from the Quest perspective, we look at uh, V Workspace as our product, uh, Quest V Workspace as providing the ability to manage the desktop virtual infrastructure. When we look at this, we provide you with several things. Uh, there's platform neut neutrality and hypervisor neutrality so that you can select the technologies that best fit your user base. Uh, on the hypervisor neutrality front, we obviously work very well, very closely with VMware. Um, and we integrate at the vCenter level in, uh, in VMware virtual infrastructure. With Microsoft, we inter integrate very closely there as well. Our preferred integration point there is the SCVMM level, so it's the hypervisor management layer where we want to integrate. We also support uh, Parallels as a hypervisor on the back end. On the technology that you're presenting to your user community, we support terminal services, VDI, so the classical provision of desktop virtual machine, and uh, allow users to connect to that. And we also support connectivity into physical server systems on the back end. Where I see the physical system use um, most often is for IT support staff, because the IT support staff typically has a highly customized desktop that they use. And rather than trying to you know, basically P to V that into a virtual machine, what a lot of organizations will do is they'll drop our agent onto the IT support staff desktop and allow them to have remote connectivity to that desktop from anywhere using the same infrastructure that the other users are using to gain access to their terminal server session or to their VDI session. We offer a true universal printing capability. Uh, the 
Quest Universal Printing Solution is generally recognized as one of the best in the industry. We essentially take printer driver management out of the equation. You don't have to install printer drivers on your terminal servers. You don't have to install printer drivers in your VDI instances. Printing just works. Uh, it's, it's a very elegant solution. We provide a lot of other things too. Uh, we've optimized our user experience over both LAN and WAN. Uh, we support several different display protocols. We have what we call Quest EOP, the Experience Optimized Protocol. This is basically taking Microsoft standard RDP and enhancing it. We provide a lot of enhancements, including um, the USB redirection printer, universal printer capabilities. We have um, graphics acceleration, multimedia redirection for flash content and for Windows media content. What we do here is we will take the, the media stream and rather than decoding that media stream on the server where you have a high impact on the CPU of the server and additionally you have significant network impact because you're, you're sending rendered pixels across the wire as opposed to a media stream, we will redirect the media stream down to the endpoint device and allow it to be decoded there. What that does is it allows the end user to have a true local experience as opposed to a near local experience on the endpoint device. Um, we also have robo, that's an easy word to say, robust user to resource mapping. We provide you with five different criteria that you can use for associating a user to a resource. Uh, we obviously can work on the user's uh, Active Directory account name. We work with uh, Active Directory group affiliation. We also provide you with the ability to map resources based on the host name, the host name of the client access device. If it's an Active Directory joined device, then we can also use the organizational unit that that device is a, uh, a member of. Then the last thing that we can use is the IP address of that device. The IP address is actually a very interesting um, criteria that we use because that gives you some degree of location awareness. By using the IP address, um, for example, back to the educational example, you may have a set of applications that you want to provision to users when they're in a lab environment. Um, a different set of applications that you provision when they're coming in with connectivity from their dormitory room and yet another set of applications or resources when they're connecting from Starbucks. Based on the, the IP subnet that they're connecting from, you have, the, you have some degree of location awareness so you can have that flexibility. A um, couple of things that we're introducing in our version 7.2, which is currently in beta, um, is there's, there's several additional features, but these are two of the ones that I'm really excited about. One is PowerShell automation. Uh, with 7.2, we're going to have partial PowerShell automation. This will give us the ability, will give the administrators the ability to script integration into other infrastructure components. So that, for example, you can create a V workspace farm, you can create excuse me, you can create a virtual machine when you provision a new user in your Active Directory account if you want to use persistent mapping. You can provision the user in Active Directory and then script the creation of a virtual machine for that user. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do with the PowerShell automation. As I said, the 7.2 version has some limited functionality. There's about a dozen commandlets that are coming out with 7.2. Within the next, well, the next major release will have full PowerShell automation capabilities. We're also incorporating some out-of-the-box reporting capabilities. What we're doing here is we're taking some of the capabilities that we have in the VFOG Lite product, and we're going to be incorporating those into the VWorkspace product and uh, to provide you with some visibility into the performance and uh, some of the, the usage metrics out of VWorkspace. Then we have um, VFOG Lite. VFOG Lite is a very robust reporting tool. It's a component of the Fog Lite product suite as a whole that gives you in-depth visibility into your virtual infrastructure. Uh, everything from, I mean, there, you have the capability with VFOG Lite and some of the components that come with it to be able to look from, you know, the spindle to the virtual machine and then out with the integration into vWorkspace v out to the end user desktop. So there's going to be some very robust reporting capabilities that are coming uh, with this product. We also have vControl, which provides extensive automation and workflow so that you can begin to implement some of the automation capabilities that you need to be able to achieve these higher levels in the maturity model. 
So with these tools here, we give you a full suite of tools to be able to manage your virtual infrastructure from the, the data center out to the end user device. Um, v Workspace, one of the things that differentiates us primarily from uh, our competitors is this flexibility that we provide you on, uh, on the storage front. We work with uh, a variety of different technologies. Obviously, you can use whatever technology or whatever storage technology is supported by your virtual infrastructure. So it could be block storage, such as Fiber Channel or iSCSI. It can be file storage, such as you know, NFS uh, or SMB or SIF, if that's supported by your virtual infrastructure. But we also support, uh, from VMware, we support linked clones. Uh, we do this without using a composer license. and. We also support from Microsoft uh, differencing disks, and with NetApp, we support uh, NetApp Flex clones. So we have a lot of options for you on the storage front. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the options that we have on the hypervisor front, which is Microsoft VMware and Parallels. And the display uh, capabilities we have, uh, VDI, Remote Desktop Session Host, which Microsoft has lovingly renamed Terminal Services to. And then the physical device uh, is another option. For the protocols we have there, uh, Quest EOP, Microsoft RDP. Uh, for users that have very high-end graphics requirements, RGS is a, a very viable protocol here. RGS is a, a protocol from HP. It's a very mature protocol. And um, on LAN-based environments, it gives you some exceptional performance. And then from access devices, we have end-user uh, support for Windows. We have a, a Java connector, uh, our piece of software that we use that enables us to talk to a, a client device we call a connector. So there's a Windows connector, a Java connector, um, an Apple connector, and a Linux connector, and we'll soon have iPad and Android connectors as well. And then for thin clients, we've got a couple of logos in there, but basically we support any thin client that has uh, Windows or Linux uh, locally installed. And then, and it can be any version of Windows. We do the, you know, the embedded ones as well as the, the full-blown Windows. So basically, here's the maturity model again. Um, I'll leave this slide up. because Well, I've got a couple more that I need to go through real quick. But I'll come back to this slide in, uh, when I open it up for questions so that you can uh, ask questions against the maturity model. And push the right button. We're giving away, uh, Quest is uh, giving away an iPad. Uh, there's a survey that we'd like for you to complete. If you go to quest.com slash VMworld underscore survey, if you complete the survey there, uh, need to complete it by Thursday at 2 o'clock, and then on September the 10th, we'll be holding a drawing and announcing the winner for the iPad. The other thing is, if you go down to our booth, uh, we have what we call our passport program. We're in booth uh, number 1113 and 1213. So as you walk into the Solution Exchange, uh, we're, we're near the front right there behind EMC. If you go and you get a demo in each of the booths and get, st get your passport stamped, on Thursday at noon, we'll be giving away some cash prizes. There's a grand prize of $5,000, uh, first prize of $2,000, and then two second prizes of $500 a piece. So, that's uh, you know, some significant incentive to go down and, and watch a, a demo or two, but you do have to be present to win that one. Uh, then there's obviously this one where they want, VMworld wants you to uh, complete your survey on this session, and I'd encourage you to do that. But let's go back to here and open the floor for questions. Are there any questions that anyone has about uh, you know, where we, what we've discussed so far? No, okay, yeah. Yes. A connector, um, the way that our system works is we have agents on each end of the connection. So on the, the server where you're running terminal services or, uh, or uh, your VDI instance or on the desktop where you're going to be, if you're sharing out a physical desktop, we install an agent there and then on the end user access device. So the, you know, the, the laptop or the iPad or whatever it is that they're, they're connecting from, um, we install another agent and that agent is what we're calling a connector. 
So it's just a piece of software that gets installed on the end user device. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. And if you want to check or stop back by here, uh, CC or Jeff, you want to have a USB thumb drive for you as you're walking out the door. I appreciate your time greatly. And once again, please do remember to go to vmworld.com slash mobile and complete the survey for this session. And uh, if you'd like, I've got business cards. If anyone wants a business card to reach out and uh, be happy to hang around and ask, answer questions. So thank you very much for attending. <laughs>